episode 203 of the Downward Facing Spiritual Spiral podcast. I can't believe it. Episode 203. It's a great one. I am so happy to welcome Michelle Featherstone to the show. I've known her for, I think, almost 20 years. And the sad part is I haven't spoken to her or seen her for a long time. So it was incredible to see Michelle again and talk about creativity and arts and songwriting and managing and navigating these, this tech insane world that we live in right now. So I, I thought it was fantastic. If you're an artist or even somebody that just leads with the heart, I think you're going to love the show. And, and it's something that I think about that I will leave you with before the conversation. So I'm watching Severance right now on Apple TV, which I think is fantastic. And somebody told me to watch a show on Netflix. I forget the title, but it has the name Anna in, in the title. It's really, it's like a top 10 show on Netflix right now. I had to turn it off after like 10, 15 minutes. And then I'm listening to James Blake speak to Rick Rubin on a podcast. And I, I'm just transfixed by the conversation. I think it's amazing. And I'm realizing Netflix and social media and the algorithms, they are all ripping the heart out of society. And it's why I still value music. And it's why I value a show like Severance. It's why I value a conversation with Michelle and the one that James Blake is having with Rick Rubin. Because it's very obvious that, that these shows and conversations all have something in common. They are being led with the heart. They are not being led by an algorithm, by a social media platform. They're not being led to try and get attention. You know, Ben Stiller made Severance. I don't know Ben. I mean, I can't speak for Ben, but I can just tell, I can just tell watching the show that it's a story that he had to direct and tell. I can feel the empathy and the heart in the show. When I hear James Blake talk about his process as an artist and the depression that he was going through when he began to sit down and start writing songs, I can connect with that. I can't connect with this algorithm-driven show on Netflix that features, you know, that's, that has Anna in the title. I don't even know the show. I can't connect with TikTok. I can't watch social media all day. I can't play video games all day. I still need human-to-human -human interaction. I can tell when people aren't listening to me because they're busy texting or watching something else on their computer screen. It pisses me off what I see technology doing to our culture. I'm not a Luddite. I certainly love technology. I think it can make our lives easier. I was listening to Eddie Vedder talk on a show and... You know, he fully embraces tech in the sense that if it makes his creative process move more swiftly, tech can be an incredible advocate. It can, it can be an incredible addition to our lives. But what happens, you know, where is the tipping point in your life, in our society, when technology begins to rule and starts to turn human beings into these simulacrums of what we used to be? Because I see it happening. I see a world where I have to look harder and, and, and look through the storm of tech, the avalanche of technology, to find people that lead with the heart, to find people that are listening, to find music that is being made not to get attention, not to get a million views, but is music that needs to be made because the artist just has to express themselves. So I think it's a great talk today. Michelle, thanks so much for taking the time. It really means a lot. It was incredible to connect with you again, and hopefully I'll see you or talk to you soon. As I said, you can find Michelle at michellefeatherstone.com, social media. She has a side project, Poplars, P-P-L-R-S is how you spell it. And you know where to find me on social media at Eddie Cohn. You know, I have a new record that just came out, so please listen to that. I have a new book coming out in the spring, which I am, I'm getting some people are slowly reading an advanced copy and they can't, they're telling me how funny it is, which I love. So if you want info on how to get an advanced copy, message me on Instagram. I'll give you the deets. 
And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends. Maybe head over to iTunes and write a review and just say how much you love the Downward Facing Spiritual Spiral podcast. That would be incredible. And that is it. Michelle, thanks again. Great to talk to you. All this, all the music on today's episode, I don't even remember if I said this, all the music is from Michelle Featherstone today. So huge thanks to Michelle. Huge thanks to you for listening, supporting, being a part of the Downward Facing Spiritual Spiral podcast. Good. It's great to see you. How are you? Good to see you. I'm, yeah, I'm good. I mean, I'm, I'm here, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> We're all here. I, I like your studio. I'm getting to get a, a sense of all of your fun toys in there. It's making me really jealous. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I um, really felt a lot of inspiration the last couple of years and, and I kind of, I was DJing and teaching yoga, but then I put out a record and then I was like, you know, there's this level of depression that I feel when I'm done with something that I put my heart and soul into because it's sort of like that process is over and then it's like the world and how do they respond? So I immediately like that week went out and bought like a, uh, a drum machine here, a synth bass there and then another drum machine here. So I was just like forcing myself to start, you know, just keep, just ignore... Oh. Yeah, keep it going. Yeah. So. That's great. I'm about to sort of downsize, I think. I mean, I I was working, doing some electronica stuff with a partner, and that was going really well just before I gave birth to my second kid. And then he also had a kid. And then so we were both like, well, how are we going to work then? You know, <laughs> that's mm-hmm. not going to work. And then... Um, but I gave him some of my equipment to store down there, and we were just using the profit all the time. Sure. Like, oh, that's great. Love that thing. And But now I'm like, I had to move my keyboard out. Of, this is my little office, but I had to move it out because we had people staying, you know, like we had like in-laws and stuff come. And um, it's kind of nice not to have a giant, massive keyboard in there. I'm like, maybe I just need like a smaller little MIDI controller thing. Or I don't, I don't know what I need anymore. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think less is more. The, the, you know, the one, well, there's many, but I, I do appreciate how for a pretty small amount of money, you can just mm. you get a laptop, a, a, good microfo- yeah. a good microphone, a couple drum machines just to sort of add a little beat and groove and you got something in, and I love Logic Pro now. I, I used to be a Pro Tools person, and now I'm like, why the hell was I using Pro Tools when Logic's so easy? But that's what I said for fucking years. <laughs> I was like, listen, this is like Garage Band on steroids, totally. but not nearly as difficult as Pro Tools. Oh, I was all about Logic all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it, Logic is is it's it's weird like everybody i was around was always using, using pro tools and of course since i didn't know it as well as anybody else i always felt like an idiot whenever anybody, so i'm finally <laughs> like feeling good it's like logic within two like literally a minute i can have something kind of cool up yeah yeah that's great and it looks like you can do it all yourself now it's like you don't need to rely on you know even though adam gust is an amazing drummer you don't have to <laughs> rely on adam's schedule or yes yeah, well, great. I will say the one, it's interesting, you, you, I've actually sort of slowly, I'm contemplating in tr- to transition a full entrance into the world of electronic because, I mean, I'm getting really good at drum programming and you're right, I can do a lot here on my own. I'm still not gr- a great mixer. My ears don't hear DBs and things that other mixers do. So I certainly rely on their Almost there's there's a mathematical equation to mixing that I just don't get. Uh, but yeah. the one thing I can't do that I, I hear is I still do love the sound of you know organic drums. So I think drummers will always have a uh, place. Right. For yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. But but I <clears throat> I sort of to your point I feel like 
It's interesting because I feel like we do have to do as much as we can on on our own now, which is is sort of empowering in a way. But what does it do to our focus on just creativity? Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, it's, you can tell you're doing a podcast because you <laughs> you're already starting to ask the, the really meaningful questions about things. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's you know I think. Um, it's weird. Like, I feel like technology, and I felt this a few years ago, there's clearly a convenience to it, but I do feel like people like me that are kind of introverted, um, there is an isolation aspect. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why I DJed, because I don't like being out till two o'clock in the morning, but at least it gave me a space to be around human beings and being around people and that really was valuable. And, and I'm feeling like, okay, I'm sensing something is strange with the world as an artist. Um, we have to do everything now. And, but I don't like how I feel when I'm sort of putting myself out there like I'm a market. Like, I get yeah, it. Yeah. I get so yeah. So I, I now I started the podcast to sort of talk about this with other artists because I, I feel like I'm not alone, but because I'm sort of alone physically in this this studio space, and now with the pandemic going on, and people don't, you know, communicate or or um, come together as often, I sometimes feel even more alone in my thoughts. Yeah. So it's um, I, I don't know. Do you, do you think about this kind of stuff, or or do you, are you so busy being a mom that you, that you don't, or is it? I know it's been. Well, a, go ahead. I think for me that was the hardest part of. The pandemic, right? Because I think that, like, when I had my first kid, who is now nine years old, right? I was ready to take a break. I was absolutely like burnt out of being a singer songwriter. I put out all those records, you know. I'd had some success with placements that had been great, but I could feel the tipping point. I could feel that people were already sort of kind of like, yeah, we've we've been there, done that. We've heard your stuff. We, you know, we don't want to do that anymore. And so there was this sort of like okay, let's move on to do something else. And I felt very isolated then because I was mm. leaving my my sort of social, hustling music life of constantly finishing one project and then being like, okay, now I'm back in the studio or the writing room with people or whatever. And so I immediately thought like, oh, well, I'm at home all the time now with this kid, so maybe I can start like scoring things. Maybe mm-hmm. like I'll become a composer, yeah. you know? And I, I composed it for a film, sort of haphazardly, that, that you know, a couple of short films, and then an, an actual feature came my way, and I was like, I can do this, and um, fucking hard as hell, like, you know, yeah, <laughs> did sure. not anticipate all of the ins and outs of, like, ended up having to hire an engineer to help me with all the nitty-gritty details of, like, placing music to film and then changing it and blah, blah, blah. And I remember going to a conference and thinking like that was going to be what I was going to do now until everybody that I saw up there was like a dude. Hmm. And somebody asked the question, like, how come there are so many dudes up here and no women? And they were like, well, you work from like seven in the morning until like four in the morning and you're taking changes. And then you have to do those changes by 7 a.m. the next day. And like, you have no life. You're never with your kids. And I'm like, I'm out, you know? (laughs) So, (laughs) so So I felt, I really did feel that isolation in a different way because I had become a mother. So then I was like, yeah, I was like doing the mum thing and I'm mothering and I'm, I, I had taken this break from singer songwriter dumb and I didn't know where to go next. I wasn't going to be a composer clearly. So where do I go now? And found electronica because once again, I was messing around with logic and it was coming up with just beats. And I met someone who was that was all he was doing he was a mixer but he was really good at beats and it was sort of like the natural thing to want to work together because I offered him the songwriting and the vocals and the melody and he could give me everything else yeah and that felt like a natural progression to sort of still be isolated work together occasionally work remotely work when I could you know my kid was napping and so in some ways then I became in a, a different way prolific in in the electronic world and did a couple of records with that and then things shift again and you're in the pandemic then and then you have no time 
Yeah. And so all I can think about in the pandemic with two children is what they're doing from one minute to the next and their next meal and their next snack. And if they're getting enough brain, you know, (laughs) stimulation and my then feelings for wanting to connect back to my music were way, way on the back burner, like just, uh, okay. Singer songwriter stuff. We needed a break from it. Electronica can't do any more pandemic. I'm now preoccupied with two kids it's not until just now, you know, when they're finally back in school that I'm in this place where I'm also wanting to connect and trying to figure out yeah. how to do that, where to do that. Because because I know that, you know, we played all those circuits back in the day together and we were both kicking around Hollywood for years playing out and playing with live musicians and working on records and putting all of our money into those things and you know, getting, uh, you know, traction here, there and everywhere for a little bit. And then that kind of dissipating and you're chasing that again. And I don't know if I have the time or energy to do it in that way anymore. I mean, cheers to everything that you say. And and, (laughs) I mean, and that's the thing. Well, it's interesting. It's like I spent, uh, it was very therapeutic to spend a year on the record. And And I didn't, very similarly to you, I finished my last record about, you know, seven, eight years ago. And, and I was noticing that's when sort of Instagram and Facebook were just starting to really take off. Yeah. And I was feeling this shift in, in, in attention spans and people's priorities. And, and there was a shift in the appreciation of art. And I, I felt that. And I, I still obviously feel it now. And, it, and it's weird. It's like you put your heart and soul into something, but then you... The, you need to release it and talk about it on Facebook and, and social media. I mean, look, you don't have to, but I think we create, and you answer this, it's sort of a question, but it's not. I, I think about myself. I create because I have to. It's, yeah. it's like it's in me and I feel like I need to express myself and make sense of the world. Now, do I want people to hear it? Of, of course I do. Does that make me narcissistic or am I not a, you know, a pure artist? I mean, it, like, I guess to turn it to you, it, what, and this will sort of extend to present day, but why did you just at a very young age start playing piano? I mean, what, what was sort of the reason that you started playing? Because I do think about how the purity of, of creativity is sort of getting polluted by, you know, the social media and what people think. Yeah. You know, I started taking lessons at seven and my mother was very adamant that both my brother and I learned a musical instrument. Okay. And because we had a piano, that was, and she had learned that, and her mother before her, it was like the rite of passage that we all... Did you have a curiosity, though, about, about it before, even before that? I don't remember. Okay. I remember it being um, an entertainment thing, you know, <laughs> that you'd go up to and touch and whatnot, because... You know, this is this is before we had video games and we had a black and white television when I was a child because I grew up in a single parent family and my shithead father took it with him. So we only had like this shitty black and white television. And so it was always I guess there was it must have been a curiosity there. But I will say that very quickly when I started learning how to play, I immediately started writing hmm. like that. That be- was as natural to me at age eight and nine and 10 and 11 as cleaning my teeth. My mother remembers that I would get all the kids in the neighborhood to come over and like sing the songs that I had written and then I would yell at them if they didn't have a good pitch or whatever it was, you know? (laughs) But she remembers it and she's like, I used to get so annoyed at Catherine who just couldn't hold a tune and you'd just be yelling at her that she wasn't getting it right. And I was like, oh, that sounds dreadful. But yeah, that's probably me, you know? Like, um, um. So I always, always wrote, and it always felt to me like an expression of my feelings and my angst and the way to express myself. And and it was the only outlet that mm. I felt was truly an extension of me. So when you say that, like, you, we have to do this because we're creative people, like, I absolutely wholeheartedly believe that. I, I feel very slightly differently. And it, it might just be, you know, if, if since you know my music, right, I tended to write about 
de the depressing sides of myself, the sort of breakups and the sure. vulnerabilities and the feelings of worthlessness or the or the shitty day I'd had or the I want this and I can't have it kind of, you know, sentiment so that in the rest of my life, I was funny and happy and mm. outgoing and social because I had this other side that I was able to express that really fully, like, got its voice yeah. in a way, you know. And there were times that I very much feel back then when I finally committed to being a musician full time, which wasn't until, like, I moved here and after college, I remember there just being sort of a dedication I had to the craft that I was very, um, that was very important to me. I don't see that nowadays with people. Yeah. You know, I think this is to get back to that question about Instagram and Facebook and there's this sort of instant success, right? Like I was dedicated to my craft. I played every single day. I tried to write something every single day if I could. Uh, things came out of me in five minutes mm. that were full, complete songs that I had. I feel like I was like having an out of body experience because I feel like I was just a vessel to some other thing, you know, that then I was able to express something. And and I feel like that's missing a lot from contemporary songwriters, contemporary artists. I feel like on the one hand, it might just be different. It might have just changed. You know, there is this sense of like somebody now sits down and just works on beats yeah. I mean, as a songwriter, singer-songwriter back in the day, people weren't doing that, you know? Drummers aren't going to their instrument, drumming out a thing and, like, handing it over to somebody, you know what I mean? Like, that was rare. Yeah. But I, but I wonder if the dedication to the craft is the same in our contemporary songwriting world because the access to instrumentation and synthesizers and plugins and computer has changed the way that we write music. To find, at least not tonight. Would you stay the night? If I wore that little dress that you like the best, would you pass my It's something that I, I think about a lot, and I think there's some sort of rawness or a deep connection to pain and, and feelings that when we were younger, your, your age and my age, we actually had to live through and feel. And now, because there were very few distractions, and I think similarly to you, I, had, uh, I used music. I had a lot of health issues as a kid. So music was this vibration. It's like the sounds of, of, the, of the notes. It, it, I felt it in my chest. Yeah. And it, it was almost like uh, a painkiller in a weird sort of way. Yeah, it was yeah. just, it, it really soothed the, the dark emotions inside. And I feel like, the, and I even think about this, like when Kurt Cobain passed away, you know, we actually all had to live through that moment collectively and we felt the pain and we felt the sorrow and we saw the footage of Courtney Love at the cemetery. And I'm even getting chills now because I still can like remember that moment in my life. And now I, I feel like the reason why I don't, I see a, a more homogenized level of, of music and art now is because I feel like people aren't either capable or able to just sort of like sit with those emotions for for a week or two or and and from that place create it feels like the way creation now is is much more fast paced and homogenized and it's 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 just so different yeah yeah it's it is it's fascinating to me it definitely is fascinating to me <laughs> yeah <clears throat> i feel like you know because it feels easier for people to make content hmm. that that perhaps that content doesn't have the depth. Yeah. 
fairly all the time. And I, I'd, I say that in a very general way because I don't want to piss off anybody that feels like because they have more access or different access that that means that they're not writing quality songs or quality material. But I, I feel like, you know, so you, you have to re- think now that because we're flooded, you know, with so much music now. I mean, somebody gave me the statistic that like 60,000 songs a day are released. Yep, it's true. Well, yeah. 60 fucking thousand songs. So you kind of think to yourself like, okay, so what does constitute the song that cuts through? You know, is it because it's a great song and is the great song because it's written from authenticity and you know, hammered out over time? Is it like, you know, Leonard Cohen, who's worked on the same song for 365 days? Or is, is that on the same footing as somebody that sat down and, you know, played a little ditty and had somebody come in and sing on it and then had somebody else do a, a thing on it? And and then, the, you know, like, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I would imagine that both of those people would say, they have validity, both of them, in for, for what they're offered. But I think the problem is, is that we are just flooded now by people who can do all of those things without learning an instrument, perhaps. Like, you know, there's a lot of tech people that don't, have never picked up a guitar. Right. But they can make a guitar sound on the, on the synthesizer. But, but to me, I feel like you're lacking just a slight, it's more of an AI experience than it is the authenticity of picking up, picking up your instrument and feeling that vibration that you said is in your body and it's connected with your instrument. Because I felt that with my piano. Like I would play a chord and I would feel that resonate and find the place in me that then was going to pull the song from. Yeah. You know? and, and I actually connect with you a lot just it's it's weird i i i'm very happy and you know me i'm i'm sarcastic and i like to tell yeah. i like to tell jokes but my music and sort of the way that i look at the world is is very analytical and my music is pretty dark and so um yeah. I, I think you know music it's weird i just i think it's just Look, I could sound judgmental and say that it's better than then than it was now, but I think we're just different people. I and I think this is proof, and we're seeing it. It's the re, the result of uh, a culture infused with a cornucopia of tech of nonstop tech, and yeah. so I do believe uh, I can't prove it, but it, it it does affect the way brains function. I think it affects emotionality, and I think it's hard for people like you and I that not necessarily just grew up younger because we're still pretty hip and cool, but I think we're just, we're sensitive. And I think we evolved before this, this, this avalanche of technology. And I think it's why we sort of have these observations about what's, what's going on. I, I think that we'd be hard pressed to find another career that would expect um, us to create the content from the authentic place that we're trying to create from. Um, but then to figure out the business acumen that is required then for that and self promote and, and do it through this new tech channel, you know, because like back in the day, you know, I don't, I remember going out there without even having any emails, you know, and, and, and putting flyers in the LA weekly and, you know, telling all your friends and hoping that your friends tell your other friends and, and, and hoping that your name was up on the board outside of the club. So when people drove by, they could see that you were playing on Friday. Right. And the only promotion that you and I had to do once we'd finished a record was play that fucking record and play it well. That's it. You know, and, and maybe sell some merch at at the at the box office afterwards. But now I feel like there you're in this place where you, not only do you have to create the content, but then you have to, you know, put it up on your channels and put your stuff on, you know, vlogs and and talk to. It's like the level of self promotion now has has gone really really high up and. And God love those people who are younger where that feels just like their normal 
everyday thing where they're like, oh, now I've finished the song. Now I must put it on every single channel and Instagram it and do my story and yeah. you know, make my own video and sing a little snippet in the car. And, sh you know, it's like everything becomes this visual accompaniment to the creative process they've had in the room creating that song. Whereas I'm like... <laughs> shit, that's hard for me. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm still, I'm using Facebook and like, I feel like my kid's like, ugh, well, nobody does that. Like my kid is nine and is like, can I have Snapchat? And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Yeah. I mean, do I, it's the thing where you have like a dog face. I don't know. Yeah. I need to, to think about it. So, but I don't <laughs> think there's another job out there, right? That requires someone to play all those different roles and wear all those different hats in that way in order for it to have any chance of being successful. Yeah. And that I think is the tough part of the advancement of technology. So I want you to step into a, uh, I'm thinking about something here, step into a time machine just a little bit. And do you remember what was the, was there a moment where you were like, I, I need to do this for a living or, or I, I, I want a record deal or did you want to get on MTV or, you know, what, what was going on where you wanted to make that shift? I moved here um, and I worked for Disney at Imagineering and I was an, um, an art curator for them because that was my life before music. Okay. And I was dating a guy who was an actor and he was making more money than me by catering um, and he was living this creative artist's life. He was getting to be an actor all the time. You know, he was going to acting class and taking all these auditions and occasionally he was working on a movie and I was like wow that's so cool I want to do that and <laughs> I so I quit my job much to the chagrin of everybody in my family who was so nervous about it and I got a job as a waitress and I started kind of going back to my instrument I had taken like a you know five-year break from like writing anything in college and then then obviously finishing college going on with my life um, working for museums, et cetera, and then getting this job in Los Angeles. And I was working as a waitress and they were doing a, um, they do, they were doing like a charity event and they'd hired musicians to come and play for the charity event. And I had like three songs that I'd been tooling around on and piano. Right. Uh -huh. And I had always thought like, Oh, I'd love to st still write songs. Like I would never, ever, ever thought of myself as a singer ever. Not ever. I was hmm. never going to sing them. I was just going to write them. Interesting. Okay. I, and then I had written these three songs and I got drunk at this charity <laughs> event, as you do. And I was like super early 20s, you know, and I, they took a break. The musicians took a break and people dared me to get up and play these three songs that I had, right? And I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. No, no, no. And, and it was like the time was, you know, they're like, oh, the musicians are coming back in like three minutes. Like, just get up there and do one song. And so I was like, okay, fuck it. I did it. And I did it really quietly. <laughs> and the whole room shut up. Wow. And turned around and started listening to me play. And so then I played another song. And then the musicians came back in. And then they were like, no, 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 no continue you know which was sort of funny and I played these songs and then everybody came up to me and said you know can I have your cd where's your where's your record and I was like what the fuck are you talking about yeah. like I'm not gonna make a record <laughs> and um and, but it was that point like it was such a distinct moment in my mm. life that that people were, were paying attention that people like approached me afterwards that people were like some other person came up and was like sat me down and sort of was like you have to do this I don't know what you're doing with your life but you need to stop it and do this and you know and so I I just listened you know yeah. I just thought like okay so like 
I'd never had any validation prior to that, that what I was doing was good. I'd always written songs. I'd always played songs that were only for me. But that was the very first moment that I thought, maybe I, maybe there's something to this. Like, you know, and I still wasn't convinced that my voice was going to be the voice, but I was convinced that like, maybe I should give it a go. So all, so all that time when you're at home playing in in your teens and you're, you're telling the neighbors that they need to get voice lessons because their voice isn't (laughs) as good as yours. Was there, was, there was really no sort of, you just love to do it. There was no thought about how I should, I should do this. I mean, I always had conversations with a hairbrush and a mirror about (laughs) my Grammy, you know, um, and I always loved like listening to music and listening to songs and and wishing that I had written them, you know, that that Phil Collins hadn't written that, that I had, you know. So I definitely think it was in the, it's definitely in my ether that I wanted to to, to be a musician. I think I also had aspirations that I wanted to act too. And hmm. so I think those two things kind of, you know, melded. It wasn't ever, oh, I want to be famous. It was very much more like I want this to be my job. Yeah. It wasn't really until that very moment that I saw the possibility of what could happen. Yeah. You know, you think about like you two and Sting and sort of, or I do, you know, being on the road for like a year. And, and I yeah. remember going on the road with Adam a couple of times. We did like three weeks in the Midwest and two weeks up to Washington. It's probably my early 30s. And it was amazing. But then I was also like, I can't, I can't do this full time. <laughs> There's just no fucking way. It's just, it's just not possible. And we had some great shows and I, but yeah. also it's just, it, it's, I think the artist's life, I don't know if it's looked at with respect or it's looked at with naivete. Like we look at Bono on stage in the edge for just those two hours and we think that they just live these glamorous lives. Now, granted, they're multimillionaires and, and they're like less than 1% of society. But I am sort of, well, I, I mean, I was thinking about asking you a question about something, but now I'm thinking about just like, this this strange relationship that artists have with with society. I mean, are we are we respected or are are we taken for granted or do we are we just looked at as you know feeble and 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 weak? I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, Eddie, I think it's all of those. Okay. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I never uh, I never toured. I was never a touring musician. I had a lot of anxiety mm. about playing gigs you know I mean I played for fucking years in LA all over the place and I can't say that I I think I can tell you that I probably enjoyed one show immensely and it was because I took a beta blocker before I went on and my manager told me it was the worst show I ever did and I was like I thought it was the fucking best show I was super at ease yeah I was having a great time he was like your voice sounded like shit you did not look focused (laughs) you're never taking any medicine again I was like oh my god but I I feel like in those early times when like I was connecting with the audience on a very sort of like you know um, freshman level, right? Playing like Highland Grounds. Remember that place? Sure, I've played there with Bruce Watson, <laughs> actually. <laughs> <laughs> this, is the, this is why I knew this was going to be the best. I'm like, hey, he's going to know all of the places <laughs> we used to play. And um, so that place was, as you know, had that stage, but then everybody was kind of like sitting right there, yeah. right next to the and, stage. And I loved hearing the cappuccino machine while I was singing. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. <laughs> So you're like, who fucking ordered the cappuccino? <laughs> just the steamed milk sound was just going to drive you insane. <laughs> but I had, um, I remember like in those early years, right, of playing out, I was so nervous that I would, um, I would do two things. I would take a notebook with all of my songs in it and I would put it on a music stand and I would sing by reading the the lyrics out of my notebook because I couldn't remember the songs so I would get too nervous. (laughs) And then then in between the songs, I would just tell the funniest stories I could possibly think of. And then I would go back to singing the most depressing song you've ever fucking heard. (laughs) But, you know, but people would sort of, so I could feel the audience sort of laughing, but then I could feel the connection of, 
of them. And I often thought that they probably looked at me as sort of like, oh, bless her up there, you know, singing out her little songs, you know. Oh, so sweet, isn't she? Oh, no, she's had all such a rough life, hasn't (laughs) she? You know, like, I, I don't know if I ever felt necessarily that people thought that what I was doing was like really cool more than that people were like oh I'm just gonna sit here and have my coffee and think about you know some shitty things in my life and you know yeah because because apparently they were all English apparently they were all like cockney (laughs) that's how I imagined them speaking to me even though they were all American right although I wanna go high But I'm thinking in my head, like, oh, bless her. <laughs> oh, dear. What she had up? Oh, dear. She's been dumped again. Oh, my God. It was so sad for her. Oh, but she tells a funny story, though. It's funny, though, because I remember seeing, I, I think it may have been Ryan Adams, like, 14 years ago before, like, everybody hated him, but because he was touring a record that was really sad and depressing, and when you sing those types of songs, you do need to break up the songs with, like, a little lighthearted story, and, and yeah. I, I remember you being really, it's it's funny, I know you're you're similar to me in the sense that I am so self-critical, but I remember you being fantastic, and I remember your voice being great, and I'm not the only one just saying that, because you definitely... I think like a couple big companies repped you as a songwriter. I, I, so I think it became clear to you uh, that you didn't want to go on the road for two years. I mean, of course, if like, you know, Cheryl Crow would have said, hey, can you open for me? You would have probably said yes. And, <laughs> and, and you no. would, I think if that had happened, I would have said yes. And you would have made sure to bring your Xanax with you on the road. <laughs> 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 but did, I like, but did... When did it become aware or when did you become consciously aware of this idea of like, oh, I, um, I could, you know, get music and, and film or you know, or be a songwriter? Because I feel like some pub companies or some sort of licensing companies were responding to something. Going yeah, there on. was I had a pub deal, um, which was which was great. Uh, you know, back in those days, you know, you're giving out CDs to people all the time and hoping that somebody listened to it and. And you're, you know, I had some friends that would also do that. And we were all kind of like coming up with the, you know, harebrained schemes to like giving out our CDs to people and putting it in the cars when people were valet drivers, you know, all kinds of different ways of doing it. Um, And somebody gave one of my CDs to a music supervisors that at the time were called Daisy Music, very good friends of mine still. It was uh, Madonna Wade Reed and Jen Pikin. They were working on... Felicity, and they were also working on, um, oh my God, now I can't remember it. What's the one with, with Ben Affleck's ex-wife that was the, uh, the the spy? Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I don't. I never watched the show, but I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> it's so embarrassing, I can't fucking remember. This is what happens, folks, when you have two children that suck all of your brain power away from you. Um, anyway. So there, so she's on the show, and there was a, a placement, I guess it was between me and 10,000 Maniacs. And I was super excited. And they were like, the reason that we went with you is because the mother of Jennifer is getting shackled. And I had a song that had the word shackle in it, right? <laughs> and so literally she's getting shackled in chains. And I'm like, I win! Because I had a song that had the word shackle in it. And so that that way in when I hadn't been given a record deal, I mean, obviously we're playing out all the time because that was the hope, right? That we wanted to get record deals. I'm sure you had the same, we were doing that. We were making the rounds, yeah. hoping some A&R person would show up and be like, you are the one. And you know, off we go. <laughs> and I had so many meetings where I was like, I think I'm going to meet with this guy from Ariston. And the guy was like, do you have a boyfriend? And I'm like, Shit, oh, God. never about that, you know? And so so, so the film and TV thing, when that first happened, I was like, ooh, this is like a way in. And this made me five grand. And I'm like, five grand is like, that's two months rent and yeah. then some, you know. And so I 
made it my life's calling to find out everything I could about music supervision and who they, what shows were doing that. And it was still right at that time when labels were, were still getting in mostly independent artists weren't, but they needed that kind of piano vocal that was soft in the background, swell in, swell out, you know, very generic breakup lyrics. I was like, I'm your woman. How many songs do you need? <laughs> <laughs> And I just made it a, a way, I went to every conference there was on music supervision. I met everybody. I wore stupid shirts that like, then I could say I was the girl. I had this pink tank top that said Dirty Bird on it <laughs> when I got from England because, you know, you're a dirty bird, you know. And I literally would like wear this fucking shirt, these conferences, and then I'd be like, I was the one wearing the hot pink oh, tank top that said Dirty Bird on it. Any way I could get in. I was getting in and I think that was what got me noticed that I had was able to get all these songs on TV shows because I was just getting to know music supervisors, getting to know the shows that were out there and figuring out how to do it. And so I started to gain attention from different managers and then they would then take me into the room and that's the pub, the pub deal came from that. And the, the pub deal was was amazing because I had already learned pretty much the business of licensing because I just had to, you know, and I, and I was able to get a lawyer that like just took a percentage of what I was making. And so he would always read the contracts. And so I was looking at the contracts and figuring out how much money I was going to make and who owned the master and, Oh, there's two sides of the song. No idea. And, you know, all those kinds of things, joining ASCAP, making sure I had a PRO to take care of the royalty aspects so it was it was learning a lot during those times, but then you get a pub deal and the publisher gives you massive validity all of a sudden. And then people are paying you more because you have a publishing deal behind you and they're putting you in the room with better songwriters to collaborate with or different producers to work with to produce for you. And and so it was kind of a snowball effect, really, yeah. how that all came about. I, let me read something to you. Um, Yancey Strickler, he's a writer, but he actually, he started um, Kickstarter. Oh. And he was on my show and we've talked a little bit, but he just put out this article where he, he reads about record labels, classic indie labels like Touch and Company and Matador. And he was amazed at how much they did with just one person or a tiny team. They found and signed artists. They provided artists with creative, financial, and production support. They physically manufactured and distributed records. They helped them go on tour. They promoted their work and the larger scene. And I think as you're telling your story, I'm thinking about how nourishing and, and even confidence building it is when you do have a team of some sorts, whether it's the publishing company or a small label to just take some of the weight off of your shoulders, because, you know, it's just, I think it's, I feel it's, it's overwhelming when artists are left to do so much of the work. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because I feel like i feel I met so many artists, you know, in our sort of time, our heyday, right? Yeah. Um, I met so many that 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 really thought that they were going to get signed by a label and then that was going to be it. Like they were going to, and probably back in the 90s, that was it. Yeah. Because dealing with that philosophy that you've just mentioned from those two companies which is a legitimate thing, right? You get signed, you get your signing bonus, you you get to make your music and make songs with a producer that they put you with, they help you with distribution, they put you on tour, great. But I met so many people back in the day that didn't want to put the work or the time or the effort in after that or thought that that was the ticket and they never had to do any work ever again, you know? And I was always hustling my ass off frankly yeah. I mean it was not an easy ride like I, I would meet people and they'd be like yeah I just got signed and I got this all this new equipment it's great isn't it awesome and I got this great guitar and I'm like fuck nobody's giving me shit you know like <laughs> I 
had to buy my piano myself and pay for it over five years, you know, like it's, I, I'm, I feel like that trajectory of being able to have the support, it was really, it was really gratifying as an artist and as a musician and as a songwriter to be able to have somebody go, you're great. We're going to pay you monthly to just do what you do. And I was like, are you serious? <laughs> what is the catch? You yeah. know, like, oh, you own everything. Oh, that's the catch. You know, yeah. But, yeah. but you know what I mean? Like, um, I didn't get offered a record deal, but I got very close. I'm signed to The Orchard, you know, for distribution. And I signed with them really, really early when they were still taking just individual artists. Now they don't. They just take labels. Right. But I remember yeah. the rep from The Orchard called me and he said, listen, you know, you're making a lot of money um, from record sales, you know, right now. And so we would like to advance you what you have made in a year from record sales so that you can go back into the studio again and make another record. What's the, like, again, what's the catch? Like, what do you, he's like, there's, there's no catch. Like, we'll, we'll take the money that you're making until you've recouped the money that we give you up front. And I'm like, yes, I still don't understand exactly. Like, what? <laughs> What exactly do you own? He's like, we don't own anything. And it was very hard for me to get my head around the fact that they were about to give me $38,000 so that I could go into the studio again and make another record Yeah, because they trusted that I was making so much from my last two records on their platform that I would make that back easily within a year or two years, and which I did, you know, but I was so skeptical at that point from knowing that like, if I signed to a label, they owe, do they owe a 360 deal? Do they owe everything, a part of everything? How much do I get to live on? Are they going to help? You know, there's so many questions that I knew about the business by the time I got that distribution deal that I was so wary of accepting it, you know, yeah. but I think that those deals have changed. And, and I, I hear that statement that you've read and I feel sad that those labels don't exist anymore. I, I also feel sad that you have to hit it big with your first record or your first song or your toast, you know, nobody wants to put the time in and, and do three records with you to see if, you know, the first single that does well is on your third record. That's not going to happen. No yeah. one's going to pay that option. No one's going to keep you around. So well, there's there's a strange rush right now. Like, it's been seven years since I put out a record, and yeah. I didn't think I would put out another one, but then... What was the... I want to know what the what the change was when you decided, because it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that you were... You're doing the DJ thing, you're, you're holed up, you know, over the pandemic, but your record is, is more you again. So what was the... When did the change happen? When did that come? It's interesting. You? It's, um, I think DJing for two to three years <clears throat> really gave me an appreciation for electronic music. I was, I was the grunge rock guy, you know? I mean, that was sort of my thing. I just love that. But I can't play Pearl Jam and Nirvana, you know, at, at clubs and bars. So, I mean, <laughs> I really did, like, I'm, I'm very musically aware of, of, different generations of music, but hip hop and electronic were definitely my two areas where I needed to learn more. So it was sort of like this intense, similar to you, just dive in and researching and listening to music from the 70s, 80s, hip hop, 90s. But I really was immersed in the world of electronic like that. that. So hearing that for a year and then it's it's weird if if you're listening to that music and for all, you know all the time and then taking 5 6 7 years off and I think like a lot of people I mean I as I as writing a book and writing poetry I believe in the disciplinary act of writing every day but for whatever reason when it comes to music for me it's based on inspiration like I I just feel like I have to I can't even explain it I'm just feeling called to start singing and writing and, and humming things and playing these grooves. And I will not forget, I mean, obviously things have evolved a little bit, but the pandemic, the, the um, George Floyd, but then literally the protests were turning into riots around the street from where I live. 
And then the fires in, in northern Southern California, where literally the sky was this apocalyptic, you know, orange gray. I truly felt like we were all going to die. Like, like I mean, that's, I, that sounds so, you know, dark and dystopian, but... No, I, you know, it is a little bit of like, how many more signs do we need that the, yeah. the world's ending? We've got three that's, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah, there's three. There's three. So I'm like, okay. Oh, and at the time, and Adam actually was telling me, he'd been telling me all this time about logic and you got to try logic. So I'm like, okay, I'm home. I, I'm not working. Um, and I just, I think that to your point and into your question, and you brought up your kids earlier. I think for me, I need a, I need quiet. I I need I like need moments of reflection, and 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 like the world is going nuts around me. But on the inside here at home, I felt thankfully this sense of calm and peace and safety here. And mm-hmm. so from that sort of quiet space of reflection, I dove into logic, and I just I I obviously was clearly tapping into the electronic influences of DJing. But also still fusing, you know, some of the more organic elements. But yeah, I just, I other than the drums and Bruce Watson played guitar, uh, Dan Lutz played bass on a few tracks. But I, I did everything. I mean, I was, and it was just, it was empowering. But it was just, I felt called to sing, and just everything sort of came together. And it was, I, I don't know when that'll happen again, but I hope it does. <laughs> but, without having a pandemic or like the, the, yeah. the world exploding, but yeah. It's weird. It's it's funny um, because um, I was, you know, I've been in this bubble of non-working, but mostly just momming it. And then sort of about six or seven months ago, my friend Shane Alexander, do you know him? You know, I think I've met him once, but I definitely know the name. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Again, same thing. We all tooled around at the same time. Uh-huh. We're all in the same, you know, we're all playing the same places at the same time with each other. And he reached out and said, look, I'm doing this thing. I've been really, cause he tours quite a bit in Europe and had not obviously toured at all. And he was like, look, I, I've taken a year off. I've read many, many books. Now I'm back and I want to do some music and I'm just, I want to do a whole bunch of co-writes. And he's like, we've never written together. Let's do a virtual co-write. And my first instinct was like, no, I, I don't have time. I have the kid, you know, like, no way, man. I'm in the middle of making fucking blueberry muffins. You know, my kids won't eat and, you know, trying to figure out how to make pulled pork for dinner. So, no. And then I thought, yeah, I need that. I really, I really want to do that. I was really nervous about it. So, of course, I immediately go to the stash of notebooks I've got and look for half ideas, three quarter ideas, full ideas that I can take in so that I'm not like, showing up like, oh, I don't know what, you know. Um, and we we got together and we wrote something, you know, it felt very strange and very different to do it via Zoom, but we did something. And it just sort of like, it pulled me back into the world that I was very much out of. And I, I don't have... You know, I really had thought, like you, that I was going to really focus more on this sort of electronic project, which I loved. Because that, honestly, I love that music. I love listening to that music. I, I could listen to that music all day, every day, all the time. I've always wanted to do it. I was loving having this electronic duo and putting out records together. And it just isn't feasible right now right. you know like he's in Torrance I'm here when we can't do we both have kids there's just no way that we could find a time so when Shane asked me to write it was like it, it pulled me back into this sort of like other area um of writing and interestingly I ended up producing it with my electronica partner and made it an electronica song even though it's very much probably a secret songwriter song but there was this shift then in me that was like Oh, I've missed this. Yeah. I, I really have missed having this t- this my time, this personal time. Same with you, like the connection to myself and the safety of my little space and this thing that was just mine. It's just me. It's not I don't have to give to my children. They're not taking it from me. It's mine. You know, I don't have to deal with my husband's business. I don't have to deal with any of that. I just like getting to sit with my thoughts and my chords and my music and then 
Shane asked me to go again and do another rising session, but this time do it in person. And we did that. And I, in that moment, just sort of got very emotional because I realized that it felt really good. It felt mm. like I was, I felt like I had missed me for such a long time. And I started thinking about making another record, which I feel like I thought I was done with. I think I thought that it, that was over, that, that I couldn't be a singer songwriter anymore because I'd switched to this thing. And now I was doing this electronic, you know, and I, like yeah. I just, you know, I'd been burnt out and everybody's over it. And then I was like, no, well, actually, I want to do this entirely for me and everybody else be damned. And I actually do want to do another record. And I do want to do it from a place now that is entirely, I don't give a fuck if you like it, if you want to listen to it, if you want to place it. I think I have to make a record now entirely for me at this point in my life. I could wallpaper my entire house with how many half lyrics I have everywhere. But I looked at them and it was like I was visiting old friends. You yeah. know, I found like all the lyrics and music and how I had written Silver Lake or, you know, like another but, song of mine that I loved. And, and and I was like visiting with them. It was like, oh, that's me. Yeah. That's that's me too. You know, like I've, I've just been this me for the last couple of years. Well, for quite some time now, I've been like this new version of me. But now I feel like, oh, there's still that me. And I would like to go back and caretake that me. Yeah. No, I, but I was just connecting with something that you were saying. I loved to DJ and I loved to teach yoga. And I used to just limit myself to just music. But then I, I felt like, no, I got to free my, my existence my you know to other outlets. But it's interesting. When I was those first couple months of like writing and, and it's weird. The lyrics literally came out of me within like, you know, a week for a song, a couple days. And it, like, it would never be that way. It would, it would be a year sometimes, but mm -hmm. I did feel like, Oh, I, this is who I really like. This is really what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, it, it music does usurp all the others, you know, and, and it, it I, I felt alive. I felt like the fire inside that although it's there when I'm DJing or even podcasting, mm -hmm. I'm loving talking to you, but there's something about that intimacy and rawness and exploration with the music that, that I, I was reminded as, as, as I think is the reason why you need to do it is that you do tap into, you know, that, that part of your soul that it, nothing else can touch. Yeah, it's it's the most familiar. Yeah, uh, you know, to me, it's the most familial. It's not familial. The most familiar feeling to me when I'm doing that thing that feels the most me to sit down at my instrument and write and play and hum and you know, noodle. Yeah, <laughs> noodle. So. Yeah. Stay tuned, man. Maybe I'll have that, like my record coming out next year. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no. It, well, I, I think, um, do, your, do your kids ever, you know, ask you about music or watch you or want to watch you play? Or are they, are they musical or, or is that something that you guys connect with? Or My nine-year-old daughter plays the piano okay. and writes songs, cool. you know, um, all the time. So really, if I want to play the piano, I've got to wait until she's not around. Because okay. she comes in, she's like, that's very nice, but can I play you my thing? It's called <laughs> Broken Arm Survivor. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, my son is convinced that he's a drummer and doesn't need lessons because he knows it all. So, um, so I think, so they are musical, and, but they're in their own way musical, which I kind of love. I mean, I am sort of adamant about my daughter taking lessons. I really wanted to take piano lessons because I feel like for me, that was sort of like the fundamental 
you know, knowledge of theory and chord structure and, you know, the basics. And, and with that, she'll be armed to go off and play any other instrument that she chooses or sing or, or do none of it, you know. And I can see that her natural tendency, like me, is to, is to play chords and hmm. write songs, God help her, you know. Um, <laughs> my son is, he likes to noodle on the piano. And they're very respectful of the instrument, which I really appreciate. Nobody's thumping or, you know, banging or clanging, but they, they don't really get to listen to me. I think part of it, like we, we've had a couple of good old sing songs, you know, where I'll play like every fucking Disney song that they know so they can wail on the karaoke machine behind me. Um, and sometimes I've played my songs for them and you know, again, like my daughter will be like, that's nice, move over, let me play this one, you know? Um, but I think I feel a bit shy, to oh. be honest, you know? Uh, because, because you know, you're, it's, like, it's like playing for your family, you know, in some ways. Like, yeah. I always felt that way about, like, playing for my mother. Like, like one, one word that was negative mm. could just, like, <laughs> shut it all down for, like, weeks. You'd be like, I didn't play never play that song I hate that song you know <laughs> you're right it's some like stupid song you know yeah but I so I I am careful you know to play it they they really got into listening to my music when my husband drives the car and I'm not in the car and so he would play some of the electronica stuff for them and they would be singing it you know and that was really cute for me that they would like know the lyrics and the and the music for my songs, but like not when I was in the car, just like when I wasn't in the car, it was like, you know, yeah. they like, when I was in the car, it felt a bit weird. Me being like, Hey, let's listen to my CD. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you learn it, you know, sing it back to me. So, you know, <laughs> but you'll never feel more amazing than when your kids think that you're the coolest, you know, that's just, that is an, a feeling. I think there are times that I've probably even said to my husband, like, wow, see, I like never really needed to go on tour. I never needed to like play Madison Square Garden. I just needed like my six year old daughter to sing my song back to me and say like, I love that song. And then you're like, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's so good. I'm so glad, you know? Yeah. <laughs> a couple things I'll let you go. I I'm thinking and, and I get the sense that you have like some of these control issues like I do. <laughs> but let me ask the question. I think part I think part of the reasons that I have a hard time with creativity or or the, you know we we do all these things you know um, to to get better at our craft and 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 I think the reason why we take it harder or something is because it's not like we're just doing a TikTok dance video. You know, I, I feel your music is a mirror into this very personal raw space and it's, it's intimate and it's only yours. And so the reason why we care about what other people think is because they are looking at this very, you know, personal, intimate space of our being. And so knowing that, navigating the world of music, where is it really just like luck and timing? Is it is it actually talent or is it just luck, you know? So I think that's something that I circle around and think about. It's like, fuck, I, I really put my raw essence of Eddie into this or this video and it's like but then the TikTok video of some guy with you know showing off some part of his ass or something is going to get three million views and and it's I think it's this strange and then and then the numbers of how many views are there I, I don't know I just I think when you said that I'm just going to put out a record right now and I don't give a fuck <laughs> like like that's where that's that's where it has to be now I guess like you just yeah. can't fucking give a fuck about anything yeah I think that's where it has to be right now yeah I think if we were you know this I don't mean to say this like, but I do I think if we were 20 years younger 
we'd be growing up with this technology now, you know? And my business acumen that kicked in back then when I was like, I need to meet every music supervisor and go to every music conference where there is a music supervisor and wear my dirty bird shirt. And, you know, then I would be like, I need to make a TikTok video of this. It's three seconds long. And then I need to be on, you know, like maybe my brain would just be in a different space. Mm, Yeah. And I would be concerned with the things that I see that generation being concerned with. And, And, you know, I'm not saying I'm not concerned with those things now, of course, like, you know, we're going to, I'm going to put myself out there again into the world and hope that one person listens to my CD and, and feels something from it and, and then plays it a, a few more times. Let me, let me just double check how many times they need to play it in order for me to make a dollar. Um, I wrote it down. <laughs> yeah. It's um, 4,821 times on Spotify in order for me to make a dollar. Wow. That's how many times it needs to be played. Um, but don't get me started on that. I know but we didn't even I, touch up. We didn't even touch on Sona. I was I like, no, that was, I know. we'll have to have yeah, a part no, two. Please, please songwriters, if you're listening, go join Sona and, and we'll tell you all about how Spotify is, um, a terrible place to put your music. But anyway, <laughs> you know, I feel very much like I do give a shit. I do. Um, but I think that I'd like to make a record from the place that I don't give a shit yeah. because I want it to be the rawest version of me and, and to tap into all of those things that we've been talking about that are real and authentic and special and unique. And I don't want to be the person that goes on TikTok and shows my ass for three seconds to, you know, the music of Laurel and Hardy and, and that gets a million views. I don't want to be known for that. I think that's the difference for me there, you know, as much as I, I did all that chasing back then and, and, and hustled and did those things. That was a part of the sort of the, the story of my album and the story of my creativity needing promotion and marketing and, you know, and and having to do that because I was an independent person. I'm lucky that I'm in a position now where I haven't had to, think about what the market is missing and what I need to put into the market to fill that void. Now I just want to go out and make a record just for me, about me, from me, you know, and, and not care if anybody listens to it or not, you know, or if I've put it on the right platform or if I've made the TikTok video that supports that or, or whatever. And I do realize that perhaps that makes it a luxury, right? For me, like, that I that I that I'm in a position where I can make a record now where I don't give a fuck. Yeah. But um, I also think that I've paid enough dues <laughs> <laughs> after 20 years of being in this town and giving a fuck that I get to make a record now where I don't. Yeah. Yeah. And probably Eddie, to be honest, in the very back part of my skull, there's a little part that will be like, well, but it would be really great if it was on the season finale of Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> yeah. Me not giving a fuck, you know. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, I guess my before we go, just what's the um, well, and I will say if more artists though didn't give a fuck and, and if, it, it, you know, if more artists didn't give a fuck, I think art would be better. But the problem is, I, I think so. yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so just last before, before I say bye, maybe we'll talk again down the line. Yeah, this has been so fun. I know. We're still we're only scratching the surface. You know? <laughs> so, so, so Sona, what's, what's the goal and, and why are you so passionate about it? Just, and, and maybe we'll dive further into this next time, but just talk to me very briefly about Sona before I let you go. Yeah, I'll give you the, the, the lowdown. Sona is the songwriters of North America. We are um, a, a group of songwriters that, that banded together about seven or eight years ago and really saw the declining royalty rates and um, unfortunately realized that what streaming was doing was really killing the middle-class songwriter of being able to make a living and be a songwriter. And I got so passionate about it because I saw my kids, you know, get into music. I watched, I'm watching my daughter write these songs and I keep thinking to myself, you know, please, 
here's an anatomy book. Please pay attention to this in case you want to maybe be a doctor instead, you know. But I think that um, what Sona did first was basically, um, you know, really get involved to get a voice together so that we could have a seat at the table and start helping make some decisions happen. And the streaming rates really are appalling. They're really, really dreadful. And that is the way that we are getting our music to um, the listeners right now. So you, you would hope that these companies like Spotify and Pandora and Amazon and Apple Music and even Tidal now would want to pay the content creators that are helping them have a business, but they are tech companies. And so they Mm. do not want to do that. And so what happens is we get left with a very poor streaming rate. And it is so bad that it costs um, us our livelihood ultimately. And like I said, in my joke, it really does take um, a stream um, a song to, to, to in order to make a dollar from a song, you have to stream it four thousand eight hundred and twenty one times. So, if you are a songwriter and you've made a hit record, and you think that a million streams is going to make put you on the map as a songwriter, it is not. If you have a million streams on Spotify, you are going to make three thousand yeah. dollars. That's a million streams. It's crazy. You know? Imagine what that was when you had a million, a million plays on the radio. That is, you know, homes that you can afford to buy outright. <laughs> Multiple, and yes. Trips that you get to go on and studios that you get to build with state of the art equipment. And the difference of that, the sort of the sheer difference of that is what we as Sona are trying to fight to just we're, there's no way we can bridge that gap, you know, uh, and make it equal. But we can certainly fight to improve those rates. And that's what we're doing. There's a there's a very important thing that also happened that Sona had a part in, which was passing the Music Modernization Act, which was really designed because Spotify was putting all this content on their platform and then saying, oh, we don't know who wrote that song. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and make this form called a Notice of Intent and that we've tried to find the songwriter, but we don't know who it is, and we'll just save a little bit of money over there, right? And they put all this money um, in this black box, Uh basically, and uh, then they would just keep making money off of the songs, you know, our songs, your songs, whosoever songs were on their platform, and saying that, well, because they filed this form, that um, that was them making every attempt they could to find you and track you down and give you money, except that they're never going to find you or track you down and give you money. So the MMA was designed to basically come in and distribute that black box money to the songwriters, um, you know, to the people that were not listed on their metadata. Hmm. And so as an organization, we've really tried to to just basically give as much information out to to songwriters so that they can see how they can make money, where they can make money, make sure your metadata is correct, make sure you're signed up to a PRO, make sure you you have all this information so that you can be found, so that you can be paid. Hmm. Because, uh, you know, it wasn't like that back in the day when it was just radio. And now there are, you know, every time you turn around, there's another digital platform that wants to play your music. If your metadata isn't in there, you're not going to get your money. Wow. So I feel very passionate because we can't unionize as an organization. Like musicians can't u- unionize ever, thanks to Ronald Reagan. Um, um, and so there, there really wasn't anything that we could join to be a part of a community, you know. And when the pandemic hit, uh, we were able to start uh, an organization called the Songwriter Fund, which gave out grants to songwriters who were struggling financially, who all of a sudden lost income from touring or sessions or playing out or writing with other people. And and I feel very proud that I was able to be a part of that and to help my community because, you know, we are all connected. We really are. And, you know, you and I go back 20 years mm-hmm. at this point, you know, um, and I, and I love that we have all these stories of the same places we played, but things are different now. And 
you know, as as we all realize that the opportunities to make money, they dwindle as we get further away from 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 what it used to be. And I, I think last thing I'm thinking, I'll let you go. And part of the reason why I started the podcast is I want people to I think people culturally are being manipulated by the nine ninety nine a month billions of songs or millions, twelve ninety nine a month, as many movies as you want, you know, mm-hmm. four ninety nine Apple T V. I want people to be aware as as I'm listening to you and you're you're spelling it out so elo- eloquently, we need a deeper awareness of well, I have all this access, but but people are making this, you know, it takes Quentin Tarantino four years to make Inglorious Bastards. It's it's not yeah. as simple as just like the, the streaming streaming services give the mirage that that this is just you know a fly on the wall it's just it's easy it's just it's miraculously there but there is this arduous painstaking process and I think it's sort of created this world where uh, culturally we have lost appreciation for the craft and and the arts yeah yeah we really it really is um it's hard to imagine that, you know, the song is not the most important thing anymore. And, and it, sh- it should be because it's the thing that moves you. It's the thing that you listen to in your car when you drive down PCH with the windows down on a beautifully sunny day and your day was shit. But you're listening to like the best song that makes you feel good or makes you feel bad. And so you can wallow in it, like whatever the reason that you are listening to that song, that song is, is changing you, is making you feel something. Yeah. And the fact that these companies, unfortunately, have that technology has shifted in such a way that that isn't appreciated in the same way anymore. And it isn't appreciated to the point where we will lose people who will not be able to make music because they will not be able to afford to make music because it's being devalued in this way, that to me is the, is the thing that is being missed there, you know? And I think that's why, you know, it's why if I, I'm already in my own songwriter, you know, moment of internal crisis about like making something authentic and, and not giving a shit about it, but not giving a shit about who, who likes it or who doesn't, but making it because it's authentic and it's from me. Well, I will, I will lose that option. I will lose the ability to, to be able to have that conversation in myself if music is continue to be devalued in this way, if we cannot get paid more money to do the thing that we do. And that, I think, is, that's the sort of, that's the catch-22 of having the greatness of, of all of these, you know, technology, new technologies coming in, um, allowing for more people to be musicians. If, you, if you're not going to pay these musicians for their work, you're going to lose these musicians as well. Yeah. Well, Michelle, I, I will say you have another characteristic of, of mine and Peter Gabriel and Jeff Buckley, and it is immense attention to detail and expecting perfection when it comes to your own work. I, I just I get that sense from you. And I, I'm, and I will say this to you, and I, believe me, I'm not in any sort of place of advice, but just know that whatever you do create, I know is going to be great because you're the one that's doing it and you won't allow something mediocre to be put out into the world. Make f- Just do five songs. Don't even worry about 10 songs. Just do five. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. like, and, ju- and that way you'll get into a world of sort of like what feels good because you haven't fully committed to 10 songs. You'll like maybe of the five, maybe three will stand out and then you'll do another five and then maybe three or four. It's just, you know, take a little of the pressure off because um, it, it can be a little um, debilitating when, you know, our voices are just like, you know, telling, just talking so much, you know. Yeah, you're right. I will, I will take now, I will uh, take on the words of my mentor and very good friend, Rupert Hine, who said, um, write the song that only you can write. Hmm. And uh, I will take that and uh, stay tuned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for, the, 
the well, next you, month. You always had a unique um, voice. Mm-hmm. You, you just you sound like you. And, and the, the moment I hear your voice and, and, and the production, it's it's you. So no matter what you you do and create, it's 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 going to be you, and it's going to be great. And you just got to get in that right space and, and just fucking do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I yeah. do. Well, once again, I've been motivated for the second time. <laughs> so thank you for that. I I want to do this more with you because it's been so fun to just catch up. I and know. It's been such a long time. So be, being able to talk about our our life, our history, our influences, our beginnings. It's been so lovely. It's really, please keep doing this because I, you know, it's so seldom that we get to have an opportunity to talk about this, this kind of thing. You know, we go out, we sing our songs, we tell little stories, snippets in between, but to really sit down and talk about where those influences came from, where that training came from, what we feel about what's happening now is it's rare and it's special and I very much appreciate it. So thanks, thanks yeah. for having me on. Of course, I, I love seeing you. I love talking to you and, and uh, I've always been just, you've been a great friend and I've always admired you immensely. And, and I just uh, really, just hearing you vo- hearing your voice brings up memories and it was- I know, <laughs> feeling is mutual, it yeah. really is. It's great to we see could, you. We could, we could sit with a couple of glasses of wine and go back <laughs> over some of those awful clubs we had to play back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh well i appreciate your time I, it means a lot and uh I'll, I'll this will post in like probably a week or two but i appreciate it I, I appreciate your time so fun thanks eddie see you soon see you soon bye michelle featherstone everybody that was fantastic michelle i really really appreciate you taking the time to speak to me i hope you all enjoyed that conversation i find this kind of stuff really important right now just this strange effect of the non-stop onslaught of technology. How is it affecting you? I think those quiet times that we have in our day-to-day lives are so important right now. So anything we can do to retain any moment of quiet in our lives, I think is so important right now. Remember, you know where to find Michelle. She's on those favorite places in the world, social social media. All of her music is on all the streaming platforms. Type in Michelle Featherstone. You'll find it there. Website, michellefeatherstone.com. I think Michelle has one of the coolest (laughs) coolest names in the world, so I'm just going to keep saying Featherstone over and over again. So michellefeatherstone.com. And then her side project is Poplars, P-P-L-R-S. And you know where to find me, of course. Social media at Eddie Cohn. I have a new book that is coming out in the spring that you can buy now. If you message me on Instagram, I'll send you some details on how to get the book. And that is it, everybody. Episode 203. I have some great guests lined up over the next few weeks, so more podcasts coming your way. Remember, please write a review on iTunes or maybe Google Play. Share the show with your friends. That would be really amazing. And remember, today I'm going to end the show with a full song play the whole song from Michelle Featherstone. So enjoy that. Thanks so much, Michelle. And thanks to you for listening, supporting, being a part of the Downward Facing Spiritual Spiral podcast. If I